Hi, I'm Stephen Downs. Welcome to my presentation, Ethical Codes and Learning Analytics, here at Eden on June 22nd, 2020. In this presentation, we'll look at the use of, ed of ethical codes to resolve some of the problems of ethics and learning analytics. Ethical codes are useful because they play a number of different roles with respect to learning analytics. For one thing, they may act as standards of conduct for uh, ethical researchers in learning analytics. They might also serve as a set of requirements for learning analytics projects. These should not be confused with legal requirements, which are put into law in order to govern the conduct of companies, but rather product or application specific requirements. Ethical codes can also specify principles and values that govern a learning analytics project. The use of ethical codes helps because it creates a sense of right and wrong that is understood by all practitioners in the project and it creates a mechanism for determining the limits beyond which a learning analytics project will not go. However, there are issues with using ethical codes, specifically what is the ethical code that people can agree on? What is the right code for learning analytics projects? And as we'll see in this paper, there really isn't any one ethical code that would do the job. The research for this paper is based not only on an analysis of the ethical codes that are needed for learning analytics projects, the, the issues and the concerns that are raised, but also a study of 73 different ethical codes that are in use in different professions. These range from academic ethics, teacher ethics, librarian research ethics, healthcare ethics, data ethics, market research ethics, journalism, IT professionals, and more. The areas were chosen by their relation to learning analytics. Each one of these can be said to offer a candidate for some of the principles that should govern learning analytics projects. The reason why ethics becomes an issue in learning analytics at all is because there are so many applications of learning analytics that are useful for educational institutions and for students themselves. These can be divided into six major types. Descriptive analytics, which allow people to create a dashboard or snapshot of the state of the affairs. Diagnostic analytics, which tell us something about why something is happening in a learning environment. Predictive analytics, such as, say, predicting the outcome of a student in a course, can be used to uh, make predictions. <laughs> Prescriptive analytics go beyond that and actually suggest a course of action. A recommender system might be an example of prescriptive analytics. Generative analytics are those that actually create new content. Deep fakes is an example of that. And as well, analytics that write content, for example, articles for the Washington Post. And finally, deontic analytics are analytics that actually help you determine what is right and what is wrong. This is Emma, who's decided to help me as I give this talk. As can be imagined by the range of applications of learning analytics, there are many ethical issues that surface. In a scan of the literature, I identified dozens of them. I've broken them down into a number of categories, including some that occur when analytics works, some that occur when it doesn't, and some broader social and cultural issues that it raises. When it works, it can do things like surveillance, facial recognition, eliminate anonymity, create a profile, etc., raising issues of privacy, security, trust, and the like. When analytics doesn't work, that might be the case where we get unreliable data, biased and misrepresentative data, also unre unreliable models, models that make predictions that we know are inaccurate for the population group that they're describing. 
racist analytics is a classic example of this. And then there are the broader social and cultural issues, transparency, explainability, accountability, keeping it, for example, a human in the loop or the right of an appeal for a person who is impacted by a decision made by analytics and more. This is just a very quick sketch of them. Now let me turn to the ethical codes themselves. As I said, there are 73 different ethical codes that I looked at. They have common among them, I guess, a focus on ethical issues. Here, what I'm talking about is what the purpose of the code is or what it's trying to accomplish. And there are different things that different codes try to do. Some emphasize the good that can be done by a practice and talk about good or quality or, or effective practitioners. Others talk about academic or professional freedom. The ability of a reporter, say, or a professor to determine what's the content, what's being pursued. Many ethical standards focus on conflict of interest the neutrality of the person involved, the idea that the person who is ethical puts the needs of their client first. Other codes are most concerned about avoiding harm or non-malevolence, as, as the uh, formal presentation goes. This is the idea of making sure that research subjects are not hurt by the research that's being conducted. Others focus on the quality and standards and especially on limiting the profession to practitioners who are qualified or certified to practice in that profession. And then finally, some codes talk about the limits of analytics beyond which the practice should not go. And the recent pullback on facial recognition is a pretty good example of that. Now, in the pursuit of these different objectives, and remember, the codes vary in these objectives, there are core values or priorities. Sometimes they're explicitly stated in the code. Other times they have to be kind of inferred by what is prohibited in the code. If, for example, a code says you shall not violate confidentiality, that leads us to believe that confidentiality is a value or priority being expressed by the code. There are 16 of those. Here are the first eight. Pursuit of knowledge, autonomy, and individual value, that is the value of an individual person or the inherent worth of a person. Consent, integrity, that's you know truth and honesty. Confidentiality, care, and, and various descriptions of care, competence and authority, and value and benefit. And what that means is that the research is ethical only if it produces some kind of social value or research benefit. Here are the next eight. Non-maleficence. That's the modern adaptation of the principle, do no harm. It's adapted because in some cases, professionals do do harm. A surgeon will cut into a person. Uh, an educator might uh, reward a student with a poor grade. So the idea here is to do no more harm than you have to do in order to provide some sort of beneficence, that is, some good, curing the patient, educating the student. Other core principles include respect, that's respect for the decisions that are made. That's respect for uh, the informational needs of a person uh, and respect generally. Democracy is also a core value or priority underlying many principles uh, of uh, ethics in the professions. For example, uh, the public service. As well, we see justice and fairness. And I tend to group these together because ever since Rawls came out with a theory of justice, we've thought of, at least in the common discourse, of justice as fairness. Although, of course, there are other ways that you can say what justice is. You know, justice might be, uh, you know, getting what's due or 
retribution, etc. Uh, fairness as well can be defined in many different ways, and it plays out in many different ways in the different ethical codes. Accountability and explicability are also core values and priorities for many ethical codes. Just being able to say what you've done and why you've done it and justify it in some way. Openness is also a consideration. Uh, some explicitly advocate open content. For example, you see librarians have a code requiring access and free uh, uh, free access to resources and information. Journalism as well promotes openness. And finally, common cause and solidarity are among the core values and priorities also contained in many ethical codes. One area of ethical codes not discussed by a lot of the treatments of the subject is the different types of obligations someone has to different types of people ranging from an obligation to the self to an obligation to one's client and to serve the client's need above oneself to obligations to stakeholders whatever that may be defined as observations to employers or funders as compared to obligations to research subjects or you know the source of data for your project librarians have obligations to publishers and content providers researchers have obligations not to plagiarize and to give credit for their work. One of the things that I found was that there was very little in the way of obligations to the less fortunate, for example, the poor or, for example, the people who cannot access an education, and obligations to the wider society and to the environment, although these surface as significant issues in learning environment, in learning analytics generally. So what conclusions did I draw from this study? Well, I found that none of the 73 ethical codes addressed all of the issues that were raised, all of the issues that codes try to address, all of the issues that are raised in the field of learning analytics. Those issues they did address, they didn't necessarily resolve. There were cases of ambiguity and vagueness. There were cases of conflicting principles and just insufficient guidance on what a person should do. A lot of the time they relied on some kind of legal mechanism like the law or a research ethics board or something like that in order to determine what ethical practice actually is. Sometimes the principles were conflicting, openness versus uh, confidentiality for example, even if they agreed, you know, even if there was some consensus that could be found, this consensus would be far too minimal to support an ethics of learning analytics. The question as well is, how would we apply any of these codes to learning analytics? We see that in most cases, there's a specific application profile or context that is very specific and underdetermined by the language in the code. And finally, compliance. Why would a person follow one of these codes? Aside from saying, well, I will follow one of these codes. What makes them comply? So as I said at the top of this presentation, I don't think that the ethical issues facing learning analytics can be addressed with an ethical code. And the reason is apparent for, for you to see. Uh, there is no commonality in ethical codes across the different professions to draw on. There's no set of principles that everybody's going to agree on. Ethical codes are going to be very particular and limited in their application. And they are fundamentally going to depend on ethical people. You don't create ethical people by giving them ethical codes, just like you don't create mathematicians by giving them facts about mathematics. People need to learn to be ethical, and they need, need to learn to be ethical in much more subtle and personalized ways. Now, that goes beyond the scope of this presentation. I'm Stephen Downs. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have.